Okay, so we have seen how we can optimize the trajectory of the center of mass and the center of pressure given the footsteps and by assuming we are walking on a flat ground with a constant center of mass height with zero angular momentum. This is basically what we have done before the break. Now we're going to see that with a very little change to this optimization problem we can also optimize for the footstep position not the footstep timing so we still need to, to pre-specify how long each step is going to take but at least we can let the optimizer choose the, the footstep position for us which is not bad, right? and the key idea is that we, if you observe the optimization problem we had before and we take a look at uh, P which, is, which are basically the footstep positions we can see that P also appears linearly in the, in the problem because it appears there and it appears there nowhere else so if instead of saying that P is a constant specified by the user we say that p is a variable and the optimizer can can choose it for us then we have we have automatically footstep planning with the center of mass trajectory planning of course the problem is slightly larger but it's not a, a big difference the only one thing we need to to take care of is that if we just say choose p then the optimizer could choose footsteps that are really far away from each other which are impossible then for the robot to, to follow because of course the, the length of the legs of the robot constrains the, the distance between uh, successive footsteps so we need to add a, a constraint that looks like that which says that basically the distance between one footstep and, and the next one should be inside some some polygon that we need to, to predefine. So the, this polygon will depend on the basically kinematic uh, limitations of, of your robot. If you have a robot with long uh, legs, then this polygon is going to be bigger. If your robot has short legs, this polygon is going to be smaller. Not only the, the length, but also the velocity, because it also depends on it's not only can I reach it, but is can I reach it within the given time? Because the timing here is fixed. So if I say that I take one step every 0 0.8 seconds, then my, my robot legs need, needs to be sufficiently fast to reach the next footstep in 0 0.8 seconds. Okay. So this one needs to be crafted by the user and customized to the robots that you need to to work with but in terms of, of theory and optimization problem the difference is really small you just add p as a variable and you add this uh, constraint to to bound the distance between successive time uh, footsteps okay so unfortunately this is not implemented in the library that is that's installed in the virtual machine so we're going to have to, to specify the footsteps by hand. <coughs> so that's it basically for the theory on trajectory optimization for uh, the center of mass. What we're going to see now is the, the implementation exploiting uh, an existing Python library. So contrary to the case of TSID, this library is, is pure Python. It's not C++ with Python bindings. Uh, it, it uses uh, a C++ QP solver with Python bindings, so the resolution of the optimization problem is still in C++, which is why it's fast. But all the formulation of the problem, that's Python. So in this case, it's going to be easier for you if you want to go inside and see uh, the details of the implementation. So I'm going to show you the, the main points uh, of the script now on the slides 
and then we go to the virtual <coughs> machine to run the script and play a bit with the parameters. So first of all, we start by defining the, the, the main parameters of the problem. We define, we need to know the, the length of the foot, which is the, the, in, in the x direction, forward, and the width of the foot, because these are, these are basically defining the constraints of my center of pressure. When I say that my center of pressure needs to stay inside the foot, but that depends on how big my foot is. Of course, the bigger my foot is, the easier the problem is. That's why humanized robots typically have quite big foot feet. Then we need to define uh, the number of time steps per step. So beware that time step and step here are two completely different things. Step is a physical walking step of the robot. The time step is related to the discretization of the controller in time. Okay. And this is computed as the time for each step. This is going to be about one second. So every, every second I take a step divided by the, the time step of the, well, here, here it's called MPC, but it's actually trajectory optimization. And this, I think it's about uh, 0 0.1 seconds. Okay, that's the resolution basically that we, we decided to use. So every 100 milliseconds, uh, the optimizer can decide to move the center of pressure. So for each step, I can move my center of pressure 10 times. And every time I move it, I keep it fixed for 100 milliseconds. It might seem coarse, but in practice, that's more than sufficient to get any walking motion. Okay, you don't need to move it faster than that. And then once I have the number of time steps per step, I multiply it times the number of steps that I want to take. That's again a user parameter. I think in the software by default, this, the, the robot takes four steps. So it starts on the right foot, it goes on the left foot, then right foot, and then left foot again. And then it stops. That's the default you're gonna get. So it's a very short walk. Why, why isn't it longer? Because of that reason. Okay. And you could in principle replan. No? Yeah, you, you could replan and then stack them together. Yeah. Or you could make the, the time per step shorter so that the steps are faster. And in this case, you can take more steps because what really matters is the, the time, the total. the total time. That is what makes the problem unstable numerically. Then you need to define the initial state because you need to know where you start from. And it's defined in terms of X and Y and uh, also velocity of the center of mass. And we initialize the center of mass to be on top of the initial foot step, which is again an, a user defined parameter with zero velocity. So we start in, in static equilibrium on the right foot in this way. And then you define the, the, the width of the steps. So I can decide whether I want to walk like that or, or, or walk like that with my feet uh, one in front of the other. And in this case, well, I, I, I take the, the standard width, the, the initial width uh, of the feet in the default configuration of the robots. I keep, I keep it the same. So I just walk by moving my feet forward they don't move laterally, they only move mm -hmm. forward. Then I need to compute the footsteps because they need to be placed uh, by the user. So there is this function, manual foot placement, which takes as input the, the initial uh, footstep, the length of each step, and the number of, of steps that you want to take. And then it just places the, the footsteps one in front of the other 
okay, with this length and for this number uh, of steps. Take the, 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 width. the width is implicitly specified by the foot step uh. because it assumes that basically the width is twice the lateral component of the foot step. So if, if my first foot step is 10 centimeter to the right with respect to the origin, then the length, the, the width is going to be 20 centimeters because the left is going to be symmetric with respect to the origin. So what you would, what you get is this for the y direction. You see, you start at minus 10 centimeter, then you go at 10, then you go back at minus 10, mm -hmm. then you go at 10. So this is right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. For the x, you would get a straight line, but I want my my second foot step to be only lateral, not forward because the robot starts with the, with the feet in this configuration, so I want to just move laterally for the first uh, step, which is why here I, I subtract to the x coordinate of all the footsteps starting from the second, so index one, I subtract the, the step length, so that at first I stay there and then I start moving forward with a constant velocity, okay? So my first foot step is just going to be lateral because the, the x stays constant. I will do this, and then I start also moving forward. Okay, this is just to make it easier to, to interface later with uh, with TSID because the robot started in this configuration, so it was easier for me. So once you have the foot steps you need to know uh, the reference trajectory for the center of pressure because that's that goes inside the cost function of your trajectory optimization problem and the reference of the center of <coughs> pressure is just basically the same as the footsteps but but sampled with the same frequency of the controller for the footstep i had one value for each step here i need one value for each time step okay it's a minor change so basically i i have this function create center of pressure trajectory i give it the foot steps the number of total time steps the number of dt per step the number of steps and it gives me the center of pressure reference which is a trajectory that looks like that it's the same as before but just with more values so it stays on the right foot here then it goes on the left foot right foot left foot and that's it this is y which goes right and left and this is x which stays constant for the first two steps and then it starts moving forward okay that's the center of pressure any, any doubt i think marco has a doubt <laughs> so basically Maybe what's 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 more difficult is the X. Mm. So I start on my left foot, on my right foot, sorry. So it's I'm minus ten centimeter in this direction. X is zero. The moment I, I switch to my to my left, my center of pressure basically jumps there. And you can you can imagine it like this. Okay, I start on my right, then at a certain point. I switch to my left, so my center of pressure just jumps uh, up in the y direction, but it stays constant in the x. And then later I, I switch to my right foot again, which jumps forward, so x increases, and it jumps also to the right, because it was there before. Okay. And then I do the same for the final. I understand the straight line. Straight line, it's, it's the, the duration yes. of, of, the, of, the, of the stance, basically. Mm. So as long as I, as my, as, as I don't change contact foot, mm. my desired center of pressure is exactly in the middle of the foot. So it, it only changes when I, when I make a new contact. Mm. But as long as my contact remains the same, my reference center of pressure stays the same. 
Yeah. This is my reference. Then my real center of pressure can move, it. but my reference is is in the middle of the foot because I want to be robust and I want my contact to be as stable as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can you have this uh, reference trajectory for the center of pressure. Then you compute the terminal constraints, which are basically saying that you want your center of mass at the end to be on top of your final uh, center of pressure reference, so on top of your final footstep with zero velocity. And then we need to, to compute uh, basically those matrices that I computed on the whiteboard, which I called PPS, PVS, PPU, and PVU in the previous slide, because these are needed to compute the state as a function of the control inputs to formulate the problem. So especially this will be used inside the cost function, because in the cost function I need the state, because I'm penalizing the, the deviation of the center of mass velocity from the reference velocity, okay? So I compute these recursive matrices, which depends on the time step that I'm using for the discretization, on the, on the gravity acceleration, G, and on the height of the center of mass. So the, the higher the center of mass of my robot is, the more unstable the dynamic is gonna be because a, a higher inverted pendulum is gonna fall faster than a, a shorter invert, inverted pendulum. That's why tall robots are, are less stable, and more difficult to balance than, than small robots. That's a bit counterintuitive because if you take a stick, <laughs> I know. It's, it's because it changed the way you control, right? Because if you control with a torque, it's like this. Uh, this case, in practice, you are applying a torque from the ground to the to the pendulum. Uh, the shorter, the better. But you are, if you are applying a translation uh, downside, it's better to be tall, right? I don't know. I know that there is a paper that discusses this. But it was so complicated that at the end I didn't remember the, the take-home message. Yeah. But yeah, it's counterintuitive if you compare it to the stick problem. But if you look at the dynamics of the system, you can see that if you make the center of mass higher, it, it is diverging faster than if you make the center of mass uh, shorter. So in the... I think in the extreme case where the center of mass height tends to zero, then the system just doesn't move. So you, you can see it because of that. And then of course you have the number of time steps of the horizon because the size of this matrix depends on that. And yeah, this is what we were talking about before. Uh, for the case of, of this uh, four-step motion, if you compute the, the condition number of these matrices, I don't know if this is the exact definition of a condition number, but I took the maximum uh, of the absolute value divided by the minimum of the absolute value of the matrix, mm -hmm. and the logarithm of this is 9, which means it, it's 10 to the power of 9. So it's a pretty large number. And this is gonna be squared in the cost function because the cost function is b squared. So this is what I have inside my A matrix of the b squared function, but then my, my Q matrix is A transpose A. So this is multiplied by itself. So from 10 to the power of nine, it will go to 10 to the power of 18, which is a pretty large number for a, for a computer to deal with. So yeah, the next step is to compute the, the cost function. You got an audience here. Uh, what time do you finish? 12.30. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of that was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So we compute the objective terms. And here I need to specify my alpha, beta, and, and gamma values, which are the weights of my Gauss function associated to the penalty on the center of mass position, velocity, and center of pressure tracking. The time for each step, the number of time steps per step, the uh, preview horizon, the step length, step width, all the matrices to compute the dynamics, my initial state, and my center of pressure reference. So this, the center of mass reference is automatically computed inside this function. And it's uh, just a, a straight line with constant velocity going from the initial state to the final state. Okay, so it's, it's trivial. And if we look at the, at the maximum absolute value inside Q, we get roughly what we expected. So it's 10 to the power of 16. That's why we cannot make it uh, any, any bigger. Because if you make the horizon bigger, then this number here is going to grow. And it grows up to the point that this matrix here is no longer uh, positive definite. So the QP solver complains and says uh, the Q matrix is not positive definite, so this is not a convex uh, optimization problem, so I cannot solve it. Okay. So what we what is still missing are the the constraints. We need the the center of pressure constraint, which here are called ZNP zero moment point constraint, but it's exactly the same, it's just a synonym, which are basically saying that my center of pressure should stay inside the foot no matter what. These are inequality constraints. And my terminal constraints are basically just defining my, my terminal state, which should be on top of the final foot step with zero velocity. I concatenate them, so I stack them on top of each other to get a single matrix and a single vector with, for, with all the constraints. And then I, I call this function solve QP, specifying the cost function. So this is the hash and this is the gradient, the constraints, A matrix, B matrix. Number of terminal constraints is needed because um, the solver needs to know how many of these constraints are inequalities and how many are equalities. And the assumption of the solver is that the first ones are inequalities and the final ones are equalities. So this is the number of equalities that you specify here. Only the terminal constraints are equalities because the other ones are center of pressure constraints which are inequalities. And what we get as, a, as the output, so the optimal value of the variable, is the center of pressure trajectory. Is the first uh, output now? Because you have to add zero. Yeah, yeah. This is to take the first output out of out of the object. Probably there is are other values that are like uh, flags saying that if the problem was solved or not. If I take the first is the optimal value of the variable, which is the center of pressure trajectory, where the first half is the center of pressure in the x direction, the second half is the center of pressure in the y direction. That's how it was coded, <laughs> not my choice. Uh, but then actually what we really need is the center of mass trajectory, because that is what we are going to use for doing control. <coughs> With TSID, we need a center of mass reference trajectory to track. So from the center of pressure, using the dynamics of the linear inverted pendulum, we can recompute the center of mass state, x and y. OK. So now we can open the, the virtual machine. We have 15 minutes, yes, yeah, enough. You can open the virtual machine. You can go to the usual directory, devil source TSID exercises. You should update the code by running git pull because I, I pushed some changes this morning to improve it. And then you can execute this script. You can either execute it on the on the terminal directly, 
or you can open it with Python, with a spider, sorry, and, and run it with a F5. And the name of the script is X4 plan LIPM Romeo. It's a constant velocity going from the initial state to the final state. Set to what? You you get you get the input. Well, you know the time. You know the distance. Is the distance divided by time that gives you the velocity? So if you see some comments mentioning Pokemons, those are not mine, they are of my students. There are some comments mentioning Pokemon, uh, not mine, yes, I want you to know. So if you run the script, you should get a few plots as usual. <coughs> So this is showing the, the footsteps. In red, you have the, um, the center of pressure. And in green, you have the center of mass. So this is x and y. You have no time here. You don't know how fast it is moving. This is just an x and y plot. And you can see that the center of mass is moving, well, is first of all, is pushed away from the center of pressure, because when the center of pressure jumps here, the center of mass is pushed to this direction. When the center of pressure goes here, the center of mass is pushed to this direction. And it is swinging laterally quite a lot because it's a slow walk. We will see that if we make the, the walk faster by decreasing the time per step, it should go less to the side. The center and of mass. The center of mass, yeah. Okay. The center of pressure goes to the center of the foot because that's where we ask it to, to, to go. And then you have the other two plots which are showing you X and Y versus time. So here you have time and x. So the two dotted curves, they are the basically the, the foot limit. So this is the foot size. And again, I have center of mass and center of pressure. The center of pressure is the one jumping. The center of mass is the continuous one. And you can see here basically that the center of mass is pushed away by the center of pressure. So as long as my center of pressure is behind my center of mass accelerates mm. forward, then when my center of pressure jumps here, it starts slowing down the center of mass. And you see that the, the center of mass slows down. Here I have zero acceleration, but I still have some positive velocity, so it keeps going. Then it accelerates, accelerates, and then here it starts accelerating, accelerating, accelerating until it reaches zero velocity at the end. Okay. This is x, and then here I have y, which is the lateral direction. Same thing. Here we can see a bit more of, of motion for the center of pressure, which is the blue one. Because you have the orange one, which is the reference center of pressure, and the blue one, which is the real. So in the x direction, the two were basically identical. In the y, at least in the beginning, and at, and at the end, we can see that there are a few differences. But otherwise, the center of pressure remains very close to the center of the foot. Uh, since the the dynamic of the center of pressure seems um, to have a sudden change 
Yeah, it's, it's a jump when you switch contact. It's literally a jump. It's literally there is a jump. No, point in the no there is no point. It's just the plot is interpolating with a oh. with a line, but there is a it's jump. Like the, okay. It's a jump because it's basically when you're jumping from your from your Changing right the, to the left, the, the there is no double support. That was the initial assumption. Okay, okay. So there is a jump. You could add the double support; it wouldn't be a big problem. Oh, okay, but it was just. But in this case, there is no double support, so it's, it's literally a jump. And even here, you can see that this, the center of pressure is always pushing the center of mass to the opposite direction. So as long as I'm here, the center of mass goes in that way. And then when I jump here, it starts decelerating, decelerating, it reaches zero velocity, and then it's pushed the other way. And it, it repeats. So what, what you can do is that you can open the configuration file, which is the x4conf, this one, which is imported at the beginning of the file. <coughs> you can take a look at the parameters of this file, especially um, in, you have this section which says configuration for LIPM trajectory optimization where you have a few interesting parameters. You have the three weights of the cost function, alpha, beta, and gamma. You have the height of the center of mass. You have gravity. You have the first foot step position, the time step of the, of the problem. The step, so the, the, the time duration for each step. So here is what uh, is what you want to change if you want to make the walking faster. If you want to make the robot walk faster, you need to change the time duration of this step. Now it's 1.2 seconds. So it's a very slow walking. We can make it, for instance, 0 0.8 and see what happens. So 0 0.8. And we rerun the script. So what did happen? It, uh, it pushes uh, more, let's say, the center of mass. So it's faster than... Yeah, it, it's, it's a faster movement. Here we don't see because there is no time. But what we see is that the center of mass doesn't go as close as before to the center of the foot. So the, the, mo the movement is closer to being uh, straightforward. There is less lateral swinging. So we can imagine that if you make it faster and faster, it's going to swing laterally less and less. You're increasing the frequency and the amplitude. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. So the other two plots are similar. Well, here we can see a bit more of deviation of the center of pressure in the beginning, because since we start with a zero velocity on the right foot, and we have less time to transition to the left foot, we need to accelerate faster, which means that my center of pressure need, needs to go more to the side in order to push my center of mass more faster okay so here i see that in the beginning i need to go a bit to the, to the right and at the end since i have less time to decelerate i need to go a bit more to the left so towards the side of the foot with my center of pressure so you can generate a force let's say it's opposing the center of mass this is basically slowing down the center of mass to make it stop at the end because at the end, the center of mass velocity needs to be zero. So you can see that it asymptotically reaches uh, the right mass. How this translates in, in the robot? 
So with, with this, it's going to move less to the side. Okay. So it's going to be a more natural. Okay, no, no, it's, it's talking about the beginning and the end where this strange. This is basically translating to a, a center of pressure moving a bit to the, more to, to closer to the to the edge of the foot. You don't see it because it's a force. Force. It's a force, yeah. So the, the foot is, 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 is there, but the force... The force is different. Okay. So you don't, you don't really see it. But the, the problem is when you, you start being close to the boundaries. Because if you have then some perturbation and your center of pressure is already close to the boundaries, then you may reach really the edge oh, okay. and at that point you, your foot starts tipping over. Or, or Sliding is a different phenomenon. Uh, it happens more frequently to tip over than slide, or it depends on the. It, <coughs> it's it's the more it's more uh, it's more frequent to, to tip over than to slide. Okay. Yeah. I didn't sliding well, sliding of course depends on the friction yeah, you have. The materials, um, yeah, but typically we we use high friction material for the sole rubber. of the foot like, like yeah rubber is a difficult case and we make the robot walk on solid ground which has also quite quite good friction coefficients of course if you go on ice then uh, slipping can become a problem but on, on normal material typically it's more tipping over that is critical than, than slipping Sleeping is actually related to the distance between center of mass position and center of pressure position because this distance is proportional to the center of mass acceleration which is proportional to the tangential forces so if you want to, to constrain um, the tangential forces to prevent sleeping you should add a constraint on the distance on the, relative distance on the relative distance between center of mass and center of pressure. You can do that, it's still linear. There are people who have done that, but that's not the standard approach because in most cases that, that doesn't matter. Okay. And yeah, in the x direction, nothing has changed. So just to have fun, we can make it even faster, say 0 0.4. We try 0.2, but it doesn't work. OK, so with 0 0.2, it still works. So with 0 0.4, it still works. And you can see that here, the, the lateral motion is almost has almost disappeared. It doesn't go at all to the side. It remains in the middle, basically, between the two feet. This is a very fast walking. So here we can generate, and, and also you can see that here, to generate this super fast walking, the center of pressure had to go really to the boundary of the foot. It's like a football player trying to. Yeah, you're, you're really putting your your center of pressure to the edge. Yes. So probably is this the reason that if I try to... If you try faster, yeah, then it, it's unfeasible. Yeah, exactly. Because if, if with 0 0.4 it was already at the boundary, you cannot go any faster. So bigger shoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need, you need bigger feet. So here if we look at the Y, you see, in the beginning it was saturating. And then also at the end, it's saturated. This is why it's important to have the, the inequality constraints. Because the cost function alone wouldn't prevent this, the center of pressure to go outside. It's just encouraging the center of pressure to stay close to the reference, but there is no strict limitation. Whereas with inequality constraints, you have the guarantee that you're never going to go outside. Okay. So now since 
the this the duration of each step is smaller I make it 0 0.6 which is a more reasonable value I think we can increase the number of uh, of steps so we can try to take six steps instead of four and it should still work because the total duration is still okay yeah so this is with six steps and what you can expect is that after the initial uh, let's say starting phase the movement becomes uh, cyclic because the footsteps are cyclic so there is an initial phase to to gain some some velocity there is a final phase to decelerate because you want to end with zero velocity but then everything in between these two phases should be cyclic there is no reason why it shouldn't be cyclic since the footsteps are always cyclic and here we can see with 0 0.6 second for each step the center of mass remains always in between the feet so for the case you were mentioning before uh, Davide you see the center of mass is never on top of, of a foot mm -hmm. except yes. in, at the beginning at the end so it's always in an unstable position the faster you go the more unbalanced the more unstable you, you are yeah so this is yeah basically if you stop at any point in time the, the movement you're going to be in an unstable position and the robot is going to fall mm -hmm. and this is what is called dynamic walking instead static walking is the, is the opposite case is when your center of mass is always on top of your supporting feet okay so it sounds like like this where you, you first move the center of mass to the foot then you take the step then you move the it. first drop was maybe like this. actually this is easier from a dynamic viewpoint but it's harder from a kinematic viewpoint because in terms of kinematics and joint limits this is really hard to do static walking so dynamic walking in a certain sense it's easier because the robot is less uh, let's say excited in terms of kinematics it just falls naturally all the time you are constantly falling towards your next footsteps falling and then you catch you catch it you fall and you catch you fall and you catch it's a controlled fall basically the walking motion and another question: The variable um, to set the number of steps is called uh, I don't remember. Nb underscore steps. Okay, but in fact it is the number of footsteps, not the number of steps, because here I count five steps, not six. Am I wrong? Yeah, it's the number of footsteps. You're right. Okay. Okay. The, this just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the number of footsteps. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. No. Okay. That's it, yeah. Good point. Okay. You can also play with the with the length of the steps. Now it was ten centimeters. You can take larger steps. You can take steps of thirty centimeters and see if it works. And yeah, it still works. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is it the step A? Step in the, in the street, uh, in the conf. Yeah, this one, yeah. What, what is this? Step height. Okay, this is for the um, for the next script. Ah, it's not used in this script. Okay. It's for generating the trajectory of of the feet. It basically gives you the, the clearance from the ground. Okay, so how high you want to move your step, your, your foot, when you're taking a step. Okay. And the, the, the width uh, between the two steps? The, 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 the length. No, the, the width. The, the width. width. Yeah. That's, no. that's implicitly defined by no, this okay. value here. So this is basically minus the step width. You can take wider steps if you want, but you need to start wider, basically. Okay. 
and it's constant. You cannot modulate it with the script. Mm -hmm. You could, but you need to change uh, the scripts. You cannot change it just by modifying the parameters of the configuration file. Uh, other two variables you can play with, even if it's late, uh, are this alpha and gamma, which define the weight for the center of pressure and the C1 velocity tracking. You can try to increase and decrease and see what happens. So that's it for today. What we are going to do next time for the last lesson is that we are going to connect this with what we have seen last week and we're going to get the, the walk-in motion with the complete model in simulation. Okay?